Welcome to Manthan uh, once again, my friends. Today we are going to actually conduct uh, an experiment to show that possibly light is traveling as a spherical bubble. Uh, this theory of uh, light traveling as, as a spherical bubble was postulated when we were discussing uh, double slit experiment. And double slit experiment is all about uh, how light travels. So when a beam of uh, light was flashed through a pair of uh, slits, what was expected was, since light was assumed to travel as straight line, we were supposed to see just a pair of uh, a bright lines, each corresponding to the slits. But what they actually saw was an interference pattern. So when you have an interference pattern, it was theorized that the light is possibly, after crossing through these two slits, is traveling as light, uh, as in the wave form. And hence there is an interference. Since this flash uh, of light is nothing but a uh, group of photons, they try to see because what you need for an interference is minimum two photons. So what they did was they reduced it to just one photon to see uh, if the interference pattern uh, goes. Because if there is one, just one photon and there is not going to be any interference, there should not be any pattern like that. But what they saw was when they sent this one single photon, and they kept on sending photon after a photon. After a few a period of time, what they saw was the interference pattern came back again. So these are the kind of contradictions. Plus, photon is just a point in space. How is it that it is able to paint the whole uh, length and breadth of uh, the second plane? And then when they wanted to find out what is happening to this photon, when it is traveling between these two planes, they kept a detector. Uh, to find out what's happening to the photon and they found that the interference pattern vanishes and now as the light is traveling in a straight line and when the detector was switched on and the interference pattern came back, came back. Uh, and then the other contradiction which they, uh, which they observed was that the, this photon uh, was switching between the two slits it's not always going through one particular switch uh, slit. It was switching between the two as though the photon is uh, traveling zigzag. So we will try and uh, uh, during uh, you we use the theory of spacity to try and resolve these conflicts. So uh, Manthan uh, basically suggests that ma space has a mandate uh, and that mandate is that the space has to act on all forms of energy and mass being just another form of energy uh, space acts on it also and since there for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction so the mass fights back and when mass fights back you have this energy that is radiating outwards in spherical shapes so when we apply this concept of spacity to a photon also photon also being another form of energy it will also be acted upon by space on all its sides so obviously mass the photon has to fight back just the way mass fought back here so obviously what you will have is each photon having its own outwardly radiating energy spheres. So you take two photons, each would have their own uh, uh, typical, unique, uh, outwardly uh, radiating energy spheres. So what happens now is when you are having this photon, it has its own energy spheres like this. Let us assume for a moment that this photon is not moving at all, but the energy spheres, spheres being acted upon obviously they are radiating outwards so photon stays where it is and these one sphere comes to the two slits and tries to go through the two slits it gets split into two spheres these are identical in, in, in nature these two spheres as is shown here would interfere with each other and they would create a series of highs and lows and these series of highs and lows they are on the surface of each of these spheres. So now let us uh, free the photon for it to move. So when it comes to the slit, it doesn't have to do anything. It just has to follow one of these many highs and lows that uh, these two spheres have created. It just has to follow and this sphere, uh, this photon ultimately ends up using one of those uh, path of least resistance and it falls on the second plane related to the interference pattern. Now what happens when you have many photons or let us say for that matter two photons, one by the side of the other, would they interfere with each other? They would not. For the simple reason, 
this is a normal condition the way we are here in this room if there was interference between these two uh, two different uh, energy spheres then we would not see a white light as we see in this room all we see will be interference between uh, various photons and there would be a interference pattern everywhere that we see the fact that we don't see that shows that these two energy spheres do not interact with each other when do they interact when their parent photon is single when these are two twins related to one particular photon's energy sphere so when you have this particular photon it will create its own twins and it will make it fall on a particular pattern and the other twin uh, the other photon also has its own energy sphere which is creating its own twins and it has got its own series of lows and highs on the surface of those interfering uh, uh, spheres energy spheres and you will have this interference pattern and now what happens when you have this detector on obviously when the detector is on it is nothing but uh, photosensitive waves because you want to find out what is happening to the photon though it's it is seen as though the interference pattern has vanished interference pattern has not vanished it is very much there it is just that when these photosensitive waves are sent and they bounce back on the next opposite surface and they are received back at the detector to find out what is happening to the photon actually these are the energy spheres which are there everywhere it is just that this energy sphere is boxed in by these photosensitive waves on either side in fact as i said exactly the same situation is happening if this detector is not there obviously the photon which comes here has the, the freedom to move on any of this length and breadth of uh, the second plane but the fact that it is being boxed on either sides now it has only an alley to to travel from here to here and that is how we end up seeing only two bright uh, lines corresponding to the pair of slits which are there on the first plane and we say that you know interference has vanished interference pattern has not vanished it is just that they are being boxed in and the last observation was that the photons you know switching between the two slits first uh, either this or that and that space theory was unable to explain and this is where we had to go back to our uh, drawing board and try and find out how is uh, light traveling uh, in the first place just the way space has mandate, uh, mandate uh, in the same way light also has its own mandate its mandate is to reach every nook and corner of the universe and in doing so it should conserve energy it should not spend too much of energy because uh, more the conservation the farther it is uh, supposed to go and we saw that if the light were to travel as straight lines it will have to create crazily uh, finer resolutions between two rays to the extent that the light the star the farthest star that we see through hubble telescope which is 5 billion light years away it will have to create around 8 billion 8 trillion billionth of a degree and imagine it has to reach every corner of the universe this sure is not an easy way of uh, it's a very cumbersome way of reaching every nook and corner of the universe and plus the energy that you are going to spend or the light source is going to spend calculating all these uh, resolutions would not be the least so that is when we wanted to resolve the the problem of resolution and we saw that instead of light traveling as a line if it were to travel as circles then the whole idea of resolution would be washed away it would be taken care of then you will be able to reach every corner of the universe without worrying about uh, the resolution now obviously when you are talking about in a 2d it is a circle but when you take it into a 3d of a universe this obviously will have to be a sphere so this will be like as though there are spherical bubbles which are moving away from uh, the light source and they are able to reach everywhere now when you have a bubble source let us say you have this particular uh, light source which just creates or generates just one bubble and it dies so we have only one bubble to observe now now this bubble when it is uh, in this particular position uh, when it is nearer the source it is brighter because there are more number of photons uh, contained in that particular sphere of the surface area of the sphere 
as you move away from the source, obviously the surface area of the sphere increases. The same number of photons need to be re readjusted or redistributed. And that is what possibly we are seeing why the photons are moving sideways because they need to readjust in that sphere as it progresses. Now, we have studied in length about uh, the formation of uh, uh, the, the shadow, the length of the shadow, how the luminosity of uh, the light source uh, uh, gets affected, uh, the theory of light being propagated as spherical bubbles uh, is explained well in the previous blogs, video blogs, you can always refer to them. I suppose one of them is uh, V4. Uh, now, most important is the today's uh, uh, experiment that we are going to talk about. We are supposed to find out or prove that light is traveling uh, as spherical bubble. Now, let us introduce two obstructions. So, this is one of the light source. Let us uh, first introduce the first obstruction. So, obviously, this is being lit by this light source. So this has a particular brightness to it, luminosity to it, uh, luminosity to it. Now let us introduce. Uh, if you have an obstruction here, if the light was traveling as a straight line, the luminosity of this should not get affected. If at all you are introducing, let us say, uh, uh, an obstruction here, if it is getting bounced back, the luminosity would increase, but it would never decrease. But what happens when you introduce that obstruction at a distance closer to the light source than the first obstruction, the luminosity or the brightness of this first obstruction should dip because when you are introducing this obstruction, it is creating a tear on a, uh, the first bubble when it was earlier. So obviously when that bubble is reaching this first obstruction, it would be weaker and hence this should look duller. So we tried uh, uh, doing an experiment in the house by having a candle and uh, reflections, uh, two obstructions, but it was very difficult to control the, the luminosity of the candle itself because uh, it burns differently uh, and uh, most of uh, the walls of the room when they reflect back it's almost impossible for a human being to differentiate the brightnesses. So we improved this system by having a black box, not from outside, this box is uh, black from inside so that it absorbs more of, most of the energy. So the candle is now replaced by a zero watt bulb as you would see in the experiment uh, which follows now. So this bulb is hung, let us say, and the first obstruction is the surface itself and we have now mounted a, a lux meter and lux meter is the one which uh, measures the luminosity of that particular uh, surface now whatever the luminosity of this particular lux meter is uh, measured and shown in the handheld device which will be mounted here so the second obstruction is the obstruction which we have shown here Obviously, it is down below extended and it is black in color. So this is the slot which allows you to move this second obstructions towards the light source. So as it moves towards the light source, if at all your measuring device shows a luminosity which is dipping, that means light is traveling as a spherical bubble. So let us go to uh, the video now. So what we are trying to do here is to create uh, ideal conditions that exist in the outer space which is pitch black where all the light gets absorbed. So this is a box inside of which we have used the highly uh, absorptive or uh, the less reflective material imported from Koyo Japan which absorbs 97% of the light and we have covered all sides of the uh, box internal surface with such material so that there is pitch black, pitch dark conditions exist. To this experiment there are three components. One is the power source itself, the light which is hung at this place and then you have a lux meter which all the light which will be incident on this lux meter 
the readings would be seen here on the top, the handheld device. And then we have the third component to the experiment. This is the obstruction. Now the lux meter is showing a reading of 57 and it is stable. So now we will try to move the obstruction towards the light source. Okay, we have come enough. See, there is a drop of the lux meter readings to 56. Okay, we have come enough. See, there is a drop of the lux meter readings to 56. Welcome back once again. Now you saw the video and the experiment which we conducted. What happened there was uh, was exactly the way it was postulated when we said that the light may after all be traveling as spherical bubbles. The, in the beginning, the luminosity was 57, which dropped to 56. So let me explain once again. So this is the light source. Let us assume everything else is black. So this is uh, the lux meter, which was showing 57. And if the light were to be traveling a straight line, whatever kind of obstruction that is there on, uh, let us say, 180 degree above, there should not be any difference, making difference to this. Even if you assume that, you know, all the uh, walls which are there, even if they are uh, reflecting 3% of the light which is incident on them, the luminosity cannot drop. It may go up from 57, it should go up to 58, but it cannot drop. So what happened here? When we moved it of this obstruction at a distance lesser than this particular distance, there was a spherical bulb and this obstruction created the tear in that spherical bulb and the photons got redistributed and that is how the luminosity uh, dropped from 57 to 56. Uh, I do want to uh, qualify this particular experiment with a few statements uh, that whatever uh, is said in the end it is a domestic setup. Uh, it is better that it is conducted in a, a more controlled fashion because of course we replaced uh, the candle with a light bulb which has uh, stable uh, light generation capacity but it is still better if we can monitor the voltage of it because we are talking about light and its uh, luminosity so it needs to be far more uh, uh, sharper. And the lux meter that we have uh, used earlier, we used to just use our uh, eyes to, to check the difference in the brightness. But now we have replaced it with uh, a lux meter, good. But it is better, the lux meter that I had chosen had a resolution of just one. So 57, 58, 56, it won't show you 57.5, 57.01. So it is better that you have a far more finer uh, lux meter. And there was another thing that the aperture which is created here for the light to be incident on this, we had just created a, a circular serration. But it is always better that this, uh, the aperture is mechanically controlled so that you can observe and that there is no kind of, because when you move this, as you have, may have seen, when you move this, this should not get affected. As you would have seen in the video, you can go back and see also that the movement was very steady and we also observed, we made sure that the aperture does not move, but we are talking about luminosity here, which is you need to be far more in control of the situation. So if we can take care of these things, I'm sure uh, the same kind of result can be observed in uh, uh, laboratory conditions also. Thank you very much.